Happy Friday, everybody. That's right, Friday. And welcome to episode 69 of the Snyder Cut. I am your jovial host, Jeff Snyder, senior film reporter at Collider. We're taping on Friday because Thad's internet was down yesterday. We had some technical difficulties. No problem, no biggie. This stuff happens. I roll with the punches, you roll with the punches, right? We gotta adapt. Speaking of adapting, whoo, every studio network in town's gonna have to adapt to this Army Hammer scandal. It just cost the man his second job. Uh, as Paramount Plus in its big event series, The Offer, he's out of it. I, don't, I mean, it's kind of crazy what's happening to, to Army Hammer here. And again, more has come to light. It's not just text messages. We, we do have women making allegations of you know, sexual impropriety, sexual assault, rape, whatever it may be, however you want to, you know, uh, define it. Um, Clearly, some, some women came away from their interactions uh, with, with Army quite uncomfortable. Um, so, yeah, he has now fallen out of Shotgun Wedding with Jennifer Lopez. That same day, we found out he was no longer involved with Gaslit, the, like the Joel Edgerton series. Um, but that was because of a scheduling issue with the offer, the Godfather, the making of the Godfather series that was you know, supposed to be a big show for Paramount+. Plus. Uh, and now he's out of that one. So... It's just kind of crazy. Um, and I know I, you know, I, I, I said I was pro army a couple podcasts ago and, and I do believe that, you know, you can't, you shouldn't be kink shaming someone like, you know, and I don't think that uh, army hammer has, has eaten anybody to the best of my knowledge. But it, again, the more that we learn, the longer that this is in the news, more comes out about it. And, uh, I, I think in the end, it's probably for the best that Army kind of just takes some time away to work on himself and, and get his own, you know, his personal life in order. And, uh, you know, I don't think any of these projects are like social network level projects that he's going to be kicking himself for missing out on. Um, you know, he, he may have to address these allegations beyond just, uh, well, you know, this is bullshit. And, and um you know, I think he may have to put some real, real thought into these things. But again, I'm just not, uh, it, it, it's tough, you know, when, when the industry strips you of work based on like the, the whisper network, so to speak. It's not like he's up, you know, no charges were filed. I just am a big believer in um, in the judicial system in this country. And, and I think I understand why, why you know, victims of, of sexual assault and whatnot don't often use it or, or trust it. And it's because, you know, they've been let down by it time and time again. But yeah, I, I, I find it uh, just a little tricky to just sort of stamp him guilty and, and, and dismiss him and he's canceled and, and move on like he never existed. Uh, I mean, listen, long term, I think Army Hammer will be fine. Um, I think, you know, he can enjoy a very nice life without, you know, being the star of, of big movies or TV shows. Uh, listen, there's always going to be a market for, for these kinds of guys, right? Um, but. Uh, I don't know. It's it, it, it's sad. It's sad because I think Army was building some some steam in this in industry, um, and it's you know in a, in a cruel bit of irony this week, his "Call Me by Your Name" collaborators Timothy Chalamet, Luca Guadagnino, they are reteaming for Bones and All, a horror movie about a cannibal. This cannibal will be played apparently by Taylor Russell. It's described as like a. A love, a love story wrapped in a horror movie. And then it came out, you know, Hollywood Reporter should have put it out there. This is based on a book. And that Taylor Russell's playing like this young woman who's, you know, searching for her long last father to get some answers about why she's constantly craving, you know, human flesh. Uh, so kind of weird that Timmy and Luca would go off and make a cannibal movie, you know, around the time of this whole scandal. Um, and it sounds like that production may start on that around April or May. I know last week, Timmy was the, the headliner on this podcast because he's up for uh, Wonka over at Warner Brothers. And, and you know, they, they put a release date on that movie. So I think if they would like to get that going this summer, is it possible that, that Timmy could do this horror movie and then segue into Wonka? Uh, yeah. And I think that if they wanted Timmy and he wanted to do it, they would wait for him. They would wait till, you know, maybe August if they had to. Um do I think it, this hurts his chances of being Wonka? I just, I don't, not necessarily. 
particularly if they get this going in, in April rather than May. But uh, I also don't know how big a role Timmy has in this, considering it seems like Taylor Russell is the lead. Um, and Taylor Russell is a good little actress. So I, I've met Taylor a couple times because she used to be uh, managed by one of my good friends. Uh, so, so I sort of knew her when she was very much up and coming. Um, and then, you know, she, she, she did waves and I, you know, she was very, very good in waves. I think she won breakthrough actor at like the Gotham award. She started dating Lucas hedges, like Taylor Russell is, is, is on the rise. I think she kind of got trapped in that lost in space show which, you know, it's probably been a steady paycheck the last few years, but I, I don't know really anybody who's watching lost in space. Uh, so I think she kind of can't wait to, you know, probably be, be done with that show and, and do more in the, in the feature space, um she, you know escape room was a hit for sony she was the star of that and that's got a sequel that also uh got dated this week i think it got pushed to or, you know early 2022 or whatever but uh yeah you know once she's done with, with that franchise and with lost in space like i think she's going to be really in demand um and but but this you know project with luke is a big test for her um the sandman finally got released a cast Netflix letting the cat out of the bag about four months after I said that Tom Sturridge was going to be Dream. So they confirmed that. Uh, and they also confirmed Gwendolyn Christie as Lucifer, a character who's uh, traditionally depicted as male in the, in the comics. Um, she could certainly look like she's the ruler of hell. Uh, she's just a very, she's six foot three. So like she has a, a, an imposing physical pre presence. She's intimidating. Um, so I think that she's kind of a, a very, very cool piece of casting for that show. And again, I've never read the Sandman. It always seemed like there was too much of it for me to like wrap my head around. Like, you know, you either got to start reading the Sandman back when it started, or you got to really commit to like doing the full thing once it's all, you know, now that it's all done. Um, I'm a completist. Which is, you know, it's like I don't read like, you know, Spider Man, Batman comics because I feel like I'd have to go back and read like hundreds or thousands of them. Uh, but, but, you know, Sandman, I know, has generally been regarded as, you know, Neil Gaiman's masterwork. Uh, they also got Boyd Holbrook, who we spoke to today. We actually have some interesting uh, Boyd Holbrook on the Sandman quotes because Frosty interviewed him today for uh, Eight for Silver, his new Sundance movie. He's going to be playing the Corinthian. Charles Dance is playing uh, the charlatan magician character. Um, and between you and I, 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 I had heard that Bill Nye was actually the, the, the first choice for that. Um, who else? What else is in that? Uh, I don't know. It just it sounds like there's going to be a ton more casting to come because, you know, there's like all these different D characters, you know, despair, desire, whatever it is. Uh, and I don't think, it, you know, those weren't cast. Uh, we got, you know, Cain and Abel and then the librarian. I think it's Lu Lucien has been, you know, gender swapped as well to, Lu to Lucien. Um, but yeah, I, I am definitely looking forward to the Sandman. It's, uh, I just want something like dark and gritty and weird and strangely like poetic and beautiful. Would have, I would have been interested to see if, like Tar Sem direct an episode of the Sandman. For some reason, I could see that those two meshing well. Um, anyways, Sandman relieved that, that Tom Sturridge got confirmed. Don't know really what took so long uh, as far as putting this announcement out, but you know, whatever. Misha Green directing Tomb Raider 2. So I feel like the writing has been on the wall for this project for some time. Ben Wheatley had signed on to direct Tomb Raider 2 and then a couple months later, or however many months later, signed on to direct Meg 2. And it was like, well, it's probably unlikely to be doing both. Um, you know, I had sort of thought that something was up with the Tomb Raider rights because I'd heard that Netflix had got their hands on, on Tomb Raider. So I didn't know if MGM had sort of just sold off its its feature rights. Cause you know, the last movie with Alicia Vikander didn't do terrible, but it also wasn't a huge hit, you know, like if they could get a nice profit for those rights, I wonder if they, if they might take it. Plus, like I said, you know, MGM, they're just stockpiling all this development stuff, but I don't really see a ton of movies like going into production or whatever. Um, Misha Green, I've been following Misha Green for a long time, ever since her script, uh, I believe it was called Sunflower, uh, which never got made, I don't think. Uh, came close a bunch of times, but
but you know, Misha Green has, has sort of since blown up with, what was it? She did underground, right. And then Lovecraft country. Um, so she has definitely paid her dues, earned, earned her way to this big feature directorial debut. It, it is a big one. I'm, I'm surprised that she's starting with such a, a big temple. I, I kind of would have thought she might have, might have made one movie first and then ease her way up to that. But uh, hey, more, more power to her. She's ready to take on the world. And, uh, and then like the next day or two or whatever, it turned out Netflix did get the Tomb Raider rights. It just weren't the rights that we were thinking of. They got the animated series rights, okay? I mean, God, you, there's 18 zillion different kinds of rights and whatnot. I'm sure there's, you know, uh, the, the podcast audio drama rights to Tomb Raider. You can hear Lara Croft run through the jungle. Um, but anyways, yes, an anime show coming uh, about Lara Croft and her, you know, her latest global misadventures. And then another anime series uh, about Kong Skull Island. It's about the mystery of the island and how Kong came to be its ruler and everything. I mean, first of all, I'm not a big fan of either of these franchises. Second, I'm not a big fan of anime, so I probably won't be watching either of those things. But it, it plays into, you know, I, I put a so I wrote a, a long story about Netflix getting the Tomb Raider rights, and then when this story broke the other day, uh, I, you know, I, I went into that story and I took the the meat of it out and used it here. And basically the meat of the story is that Netflix is, they don't have a lot of IP to fall back on, right? So they've been turning to video games, which is why they have shows, you know, they have the Division movie and, and Splinter Cell and Final Fantasy and Sonic the Hedgehog and uh, Resident Evil. And I mean, it's just an endless amount of properties that are being developed based on video games. I think it's a smart strategy for Netflix, it's not a strategy I'm particularly interested in, but as a business strategy, I can uh, appreciate it. So, so read up, uh, uh, you know, that article for just a little bit more background on, on what Netflix is up to over there. Um, all right, I wanted to talk about. We're going to interrupt the news for a, a little review action. Uh, I wanted to talk about the little things. So, by the time that you read that you see this podcast or hear it or whatever, I will have posted my top ten Jared Leto movies list. And I and I, uh, you know, procrastinated on it on this on that list as long as I did, uh, because I, I wanted to see the little things. I, I suspected that the little things would have a place on that list, and sure enough, it did. It wasn't you know a top three or anything like that. Um, and the movie itself, I thought was just okay. I was a little disappointed by it, uh, especially considering the trailer, which I thought was really good. But this project had also been around for like 25, 30 years, and, and there's usually a good reason for that. Uh, now that now John Lee Hancock got three Oscar winners to do this, right? You can't ask for, for a much better cast than Denzel, Rami Malek, and Jared Leto. I think the problem is that one of these people is, is a little miscast. And it's funny reading the reviews, everybody sort of has a different favorite. There are people who I'm just like, oh, Denzel does it again. You know, he's just so good. Uh, and that he's just so subtle and restrained in this. And then I saw people, well, Rami, Rami Malek actually did something really interesting with his character and he makes him kind of religious and eccentric and this, this and that. And then there are people like me who thought Jared Leto fucking owned this movie, okay? Jared Leto's the best thing about this movie. Sorry, sorry, Denzel. Um, Denzel played it a little too subtle, a little too cool. Uh, I mean, he was good, he always is, he's Denzel. But Jared Leto, to me, I couldn't take my eyes wide, uh, off him on the screen. Whenever Jared Leto is on screen, I was mesmerized. Um, now, the movie, it's, it's, like, it's like a bit of a rope-a-dope, like, right? It kind of sets you up to be, I mean, fuck, I'm just going to, you know, I don't want to ruin anything. Not that this movie even gives you necessarily definitive ans answers, um, but... You can just see, like Jared Leto is described in the synopsis and things like that as the suspected serial killer. You know, he's it, it, the movie doesn't it, it it kind of does position him as like this is the guy. And in fact, it, I, one thing I will give this movie credit for is if you pay attention to some of the songs, the old the oldies, the golden oldies that Hancock populates the soundtrack with, uh, they they sort of tell the story of the investigation, like. I think uh, with with you know once they identify Leto's character, the first song you hear, one of the first songs is "My Guy," you know, like "Tear Me Away from My Guy, My Guy," because he's my guy, right? He's Denzel's guy. Um, there's a couple of other song titles that that uh, 
can be used to describe the way this uh, investigation is unfolding. Ultimately, you know, not much happens in this movie, right? It's a lot of people sort of staking things out, sitting in cars, having conversations, looking at crime scene photos. Uh, it's not, there aren't a ton of thrills for, for a thriller, for a big studio thriller like this. What this movie comes down to, and this is the way it was described to me too, is like, you know, the first 105 minutes are okay, and then the last 15 minutes are good. And I agree. I think that the end of this movie was pretty good. Yes, it is a lot like Seven in that it's all about, you know, the, the character's moral codes and, and, you know, how far someone is willing to go to, to save a, a, a good man. Um, so, like, I would recommend this movie, but I would temper your expectations. It is not the movie that... You're th that you think it is or the movie that HBO Max is really selling. It's, it's um, much moodier and broodier. And uh, again, I, I appreciated it. I, I, I wanted a little bit more for sure. Um, I thought it could have been a little bit better. I thought that Rami Malek, I, would, I just would have liked someone a little bit more clean cut and, and uh, a little bit more... I don't know, like to, just more of that like square jawed hero. Brownie Malik's fucking weirdo. He, he's just, I think he's too weird. In fact, you know, there's a scene of him like talking to the media or he, he may have to talk to the media multiple times in this movie. They would never put a guy like that in front of the media, okay? He's not the guy that, that you stick in front of the media. Um, yeah, I, I think something, someone like, I don't even know, Chris Pine or Jake Gyllenhaal or just somebody who, who, yeah, I don't know. I just Rom, Rami left a, a weird, a weird taste in my mouth. I, I don't think that he, he really works. He's kind of just doing almost like it's Freddie Mercury again, but, uh, but check out the little things. Cause I do think it's, it is worthwhile. Um, speaking of Jared Leto, Jared Leto got a hell of a job this week and he is going to reteam with his Requiem for a Dream director, Darren Aronofsky on a Blumhouse movie titled Adrift. First of all, I like the idea of Jared Leto leading a Blumhouse movie. That 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 makes sense to me. This is like a ghost ship movie. Now, you say ghost ship movie, you think the movie Ghost Ship, which is like a you know a schlocky B movie splatter fest kind of. It was just like studio horror done all the way wrong. Um, if you did a ghost ship movie and it's from Aronofsky and it stars Jared Leto and you did it in the vein of like. Noah meets the lighthouse or something like a prestige art house ghost ship horror movie where, you know, there's only one survivor aboard or whatever the hell is going on. I think it'd be pretty cool. So I, I you know, I like that. I like the idea of Aronofsky working with Blumhouse. Uh, he's still going to do the Brendan Fraser movie, the whale first for a 24. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that, but it, listen, Aronofsky before he kind of, I don't want to say lost his way, but like he was up there, right? With, with the Fincher and PTA and uh, right. Mo Mother was just atrocious. So I'm kind of glad that Aronofsky is getting back on the horse and doing projects that I'm, I'm really uh, quite excited about. Uh, and speaking of Blumhouse, they announced that Ethan Hawke is going to be joining Jeremy Davies in Scott Derrickson, new, uh, Scott Derrickson's new movie, The Black Phone. You know me, I'm, uh, I'm a Hawkeye, Hawkeye guy, Ethan Hawke. Um, yeah. And, and that's a reunion too, you know, uh, Sinister, Scott Derrickson, Ethan Hawke. So we've got Leto and Aronofsky reuniting, Hawke and Derrickson reuniting. We got Michelle Williams and Kelly Rykar reuniting for something called Showing Up. And she's going to be like an, an artist prepping for this big show. And it's all about, you know, the insanity ar around that. It sounds a little bit more uh, commercial and accessible than most of Kelly Rykar's movies. Uh, I think that she is very much an acquired taste. Um, I did not see Meek's cutoff for certain women uh, or even first cow, but I did like, you know, their first movie together, Wendy and Lucy. And I, and I liked when, you know, it wasn't, it maybe wasn't a completely successful attempt, but I liked when Kelly did try to do something a little bit more commercial and mainstream with night moves, uh, you know, with, with Dakota Fanning. So it's, a, it's another interesting reunion that we have here. Um, other reunions. Robert Rodriguez reuniting with the Spy Kids. He's going to go do a, a reinvention for Skydance. Um, and even though I think Robert Rodriguez kind of needs to give up the, the, the Spy Kids of it all, give that to like some, you know, 
rookie director or something and you, you just stay on board to produce it and oversee it. I don't understand why this guy insists on, on continuing to direct these movies. Uh, I can see how this makes sense. I, I mean, I haven't seen a Spy Kids movie and, and I think it's, just, like, I just don't care at all about the franchise, but it's like a homemade sort of handcrafted thing, right? That Robert Rodriguez does on, on a budget at his own Troublemaker Studios. If you, if you take this concept and then you put it in the hands of Skydance and you make this big thing out of it, I could see that actually working really well. I, I mean, it's almost like you're just paying for the, the, the name Spy Kids because you can do your own spy, you know, children's spy franchise or whatever. Uh, I just think it's, it's the title and, and maybe, you know, Robert's expertise. I mean, he is, he, he is a, a good director. And if you gave him, you know, three, four, five times the budget for one of those movies. Like, I wonder if I could actually make it appeal to guys like me. Um, some Apple shows were announced. Taron Edgerton and Paul Walter Hauser, my man in In With The Devil, which uh, is from Michael Roskam, who did Bullhead and The Drop, and then Dennis Lehane, who also, I believe, did The Drop and, uh, you know, Mystic River and Shutter Island and all that. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, Taron's like a, a, a guy who goes to jail to try to get another murderer to confess. Uh, and Paul Walter Hauser is going to be that suspected, um, you know, serial killer or whatever. And I don't know if he, if he actually is guilty in this story or if this turns out to be one of those things where he's not confessing because he, he really didn't do it. But I like all the elements here. I, I like the two of those guys working together. I'm actually thrilled that, that Paul Walter Hauser got his own uh, you know, lead role in an Apple show. Um, and yeah, I like the idea of Dennis Lehane working with someone like Michael Roskam. So that is definitely a show that is, that is being added to my list. Apple also ordered a Brie Larson show titled Lessons in Chemistry. That one didn't appeal to me as much. That, that just seemed like a kind of old fashioned thing. I want to be in, in business with this Oscar winning star, but I just don't know if like that, the show itself was, was there. I mean, I haven't seen it, but the premise just didn't do much for me. Uh, HBO is de developing this, something called The Fact of a Body with Jeremiah Zagar, whose We the Animals I really liked. Uh, this one is about like a young lawyer who, who is very much against the death penalty, but then she's assigned to uh, this case involving this child murderer uh, who, whose own story parallels her own trauma. Uh, and then... I don't know, maybe she like starts, to, I, I think she starts to come around to the idea of, of the death penalty. I just, uh, this is the kind of, of HBO drama that I am into. You know, I, I'm not, I haven't loved a lot of the HBO stuff of late. And I'm not even talking about like the undoing, which I gave a B plus to, and, and I just had a, a poor finale or whatever. There's just a lot of stuff on HBO that I haven't been watching lately. You know, whether it's like Westworld or I'm trying to think of, you know, I mean, I never watched Game of Thrones, but Succession. Um, you know, I, I, I like true crime dramas and murder stuff. And HBO, I think, got away from that for a bit. And understandably so. I mean, Netflix, you know, it basically went all in and everybody was, you know, I think, uh, you know, the audience for that kind of stuff also mi migrated to like audio podcasts and stuff. But that's what I like to, to see, and I'm glad that HBO uh, has committed to, to both this show, which has a really interesting premise, and someone like Jeremiah Zagar, who, who's a, a very talented indie filmmaker. Uh, elsewhere in the news, tons of tons of announcements this week. Claire Foy teaming with Jillian Rose Pierre on the Pisces. This was kind of interesting. Uh, Claire Foy basically developed, she's like a PhD student. She's got writer's block, and she becomes infatuated with a merman. Um, yeah, sounds kind of trippy. Uh, Claire Foy, you know, had a moment a couple years ago. First man, girl who kicked the, the spiders, girl in the spiders web or whatever. Um, I know she's always going to be the crown person to, to most people, but uh, I don't know. She's, she's okay. She's a decent actress. This movie, you know, this premise sounds kind of out there. Julian Robes Pierre, decent director. We'll see how that package turns out. Uh, this package I like. I like John Boyega and Robert De Niro teaming for the formula on Netflix. John Boyega is going to play like a Formula One racer who becomes a getaway driver. I don't know if De Niro will be, you know, the leader of the, the bad guys or a cop or, you know, what 
he's going to be maybe, you know, the, the racing crew chief. I don't know, but uh, I like the two of them teaming up. It's, I'm, I'm glad to see, I love John Boyega in red, white, and blue. Um, and I want to see him as a lead outside of the star Wars franchise and not in, you know, Pacific Rim two or whatever the hell it was. So uh, this sounds, yeah, it sounds a bit like drive, you know, that was about a, a driver who was a getaway driver, and, you know, but I, I, I you, you know, you also don't see a lot of uh, black guys playing race car drivers. So that's cool. Bohega and De Niro. I dig it. Karen Mulligan uh, teaming with Christos Nico for uh, this movie Fingernails. He's the, the Greek director behind Greece's submission Apples. This kind of sounds like a, uh, what does it sound like? Like a uh, the fucking guy who did the lobster in the face. A Yorgos Lanthimos movie. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like that that uh, weird movie that he did before this. That I'm blanking. Oh, God. Where the whole family has to like stay inside all day. Uh, and it doesn't have any contact with anybody. Carrie Mulligan, great actress. Fingernails, folks. Fingernails. George Clooney, Buck Rogers. This is like what a legendary series. I think I've talked about Buck Rogers on this podcast before. This is one of those like major Matt Mason uh, characters, or or what's the other one? Um, oh, Sam ha- Sam Worthington was going to play him. Fuck. Just guys like from the fifties. Like who cares about this stuff? Buck Rogers, get the fuck out of here. Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, Quartermain. This is like from another generation. This is like if Indiana Jones was still Indiana Jones, maybe you could get away with doing Buck Rogers, but uh, the world has moved on. Uh, if Indi- I mean, if Indiana Jones hadn't been played by Harrison Ford, like would people even be excited by Indiana Jones 5? I just, this is like old serials. I, I don't understand any of it. I don't, I don't understand who is pushing this rock up the hill for the last 20 years. I swear to God, every year that I've been a reporter, there's been some type of like Buck Rogers movement. Uh, Stop. Nobody cares. Even with George Clooney. Uh, Henry, Henry juice and Ariel Schumann doing secret headquarters for Paramount and Jerry Bruckheimer. They're apparently putting this one on a fast track. It's going to be high priority over there. That's good to know because I mean, does Paramount even have, other priorities like are there low priorities over there they don't even have any projects they just make mission they just make tom cruise movies so this has got to be something really special for paramount and jerry bruckheimer to get excited uh the guys are coming off of you know project power uh i can't wait to see to hear more about what this project is actually about chris messina and pilu Azbek in gabriella cowperthwaite's space station movie iss uh, I like both these actors, and I'm actually looking forward to Gabriella's new movie, Our Friend, uh, which I have a screener waiting for me. But another movie set on a space station, you know, where shit goes wrong. I've seen it a zillion times. I don't care. Uh, Taylor John Smith and Harris Dickinson in Where the Crawdads Sing with Daisy Edgar Jones. This is a huge uh, literary sensation, a big book. Uh, could be a, a sleeper hit of a movie. Could be the next uh, Tulip Fever or whatever. You know, there's so many of these big literary titles, uh, and then nobody goes to see them when they actually come out in theaters. I do like both these actors, though. I like Harris Dickinson and uh, Taylor John Smith, who's my choice to play Tom Brady in in that biopic down the line. I'm sure you you know Tom Brady's getting a biopic. If they're making a fucking movie about Kurt Warner right now, uh, Tom Brady's getting a movie, and Taylor John Smith might just be the guy. But he's not someone that people really know by name, and and maybe after this movie, Where the Crawdads Dead Sing, he will be. Uh, Nicole Kidman signing on to do another Amazon series, Hope. I I didn't even click on this article. I'm including it for posterity, but she just has so many shows and seemingly shows at Amazon. I was just like, I can't, whatever. I'll I'll, I'll find out what it's about when when it's the streaming service. Uh, Hugh Grant and Josh Hartnett in Five Eyes. This is the new Guy Ritchie movie. Actually, I I feel like I went long on that article because I had a lot to say about Josh Hartnett who really, this is his biggest role in, it's got to be 13 years, since 30 Days a Night. Um, he just has, you know, been chilling on the sidelines. He did some Penny Dreadful stuff on Showtime, but like the movies Josh Hartnett has been in the last dozen so or so years are not uh, anything notable. 
Um, so, you know, he could really work in a Guy Ritchie movie. And, and it's great to see him uh, reteam with, with Hugh Grant, Guy Ritchie, after The Gentleman, because I thought Hugh Grant was like the best thing in that movie. Dylan McDermott joining uh, Chris Maloney's Law and Order Organized Crime spinoff. I also had a great deal to say about Dylan McDermott. I like this guy. I like him. Uh, you know, I never really like watched his TV shows. They weren't for me. And because he's like a big TV star. But I don't think he is. A t- he's like he's more of a character actor to me. He's just a very handsome character actor. And I like the movies that I see him in. Um, I do think that he will be perfect in uh, this new Law and Order spinoff, whether he is playing Chris Maloney's partner, his captain, uh, the DA, whatever it is. Uh, I, I'm definitely down for a weekly dose of, of McDermott on that show. Uh, Corey Hawkins doing Last Voyage of the Demeter. This is another project that's been around 20 years, maybe. Um, doesn't sound particularly interesting to me. Sounds like a Netflix movie. Uh, and Corey Hawkins, you know, I like him fine. Is, is he a movie star? Like the kind of guy we want as the lead in, in a movie like this? Like we waited 20 years to make this movie so that it could start Corey Hawkins? Nah, I don't think so. Um, Alton Mason was cast as Little Richard in Elvis, which also moved this week from November uh, end of the year to to next June. There was definitely some confusion when when HBO Max made its big announcement, uh, you know, about what movies would be debuting this year, um, and Elvis was not on it. So people were thinking, oh, is that because you know Elvis is is being held out for theaters? Is it like an, an Oscar play? It turns out it's just getting delayed. Um, and then Hillary Clinton and Chelsea Clinton doing the Daughters of Kobani series. It's about a Kurdish female militia that took on ISIS. Okay. Yeah, sure. Hillary Clinton. Uh, that's, it's like, I get that. Like what a great, inspiring, true story. But like, again, who is this for? Who are you making this movie with? Who are, who is going to play the Kurdish female militia? Like, I don't, you have to like keep that stuff in mind, right? It can't, it has to be about a little bit more than just, is this a great story? Is, you know, how do we make this story and, and how do we make it, uh, you know, appetizing to, to general audiences? It's just, I don't, I, don't, I don't see that becoming a big Netflix sensation or whoever they're making that for. Uh, speaking of Netflix, Noah Bombach signs a big deal with Netflix um, you know, t- financial terms were not disclosed. I don't think he's getting Ryan Murphy or Shonda Rhimes money. That's for sure. It's just, it's a home. It's a place, you know, uh, you know, do whatever you want. Here's the creative freedom. Here is more money than you're ever going to get from any other, you know, indie studio or whatever. And just, you know, go do what you want. So, uh, what he wants is to do, uh, Don DeLillo's white noise. And then he's going to reteam him with Adam Driver and uh, Noah's longtime creative muse, Greta Gerwig, they're going to play a couple who are forced to confront their own mortality. They're, they're afraid of death. Now they have to confront their own mortality when a toxic chemical is released in their town. Uh, I think this is, you know, it sounds interesting. I like the idea of Driver and, and Gerwig working together. And uh, yeah, I want Noah Baumbach to keep making movies. I want him to, to feel secure. And uh, so I, I think this is a win for him, for Netflix, and for subscribers. Uh, speaking of overall deals, Dan Lin signed a deal with with Universal. He is definitely one of the, the, the biggest and best producers in town. And then Wes Ball, did, uh, who did the Maze Runner movies, he signed a Paramount deal. Um, and we'll see if, uh, you know, I, I forget when or where I read this, but there was a little note about, Mo- I think maybe it was in that story about Mouse Guard sort of being redeveloped for television. I don't know if that could be for Disney Plus or, or some other streaming service, uh, maybe even for, for, for Paramount Plus. I don't know if Disney would be willing to give up the rights to that. It, it, it beats me, but uh, I know how much work West Ball put into that. And so it'd be nice to, to see something come of it. Uh, we got our first look at Kristen Stewart in Spencer. She looked more like Diana than I thought she would, but at the same time, she did not look like Diana to me. I think it was the nose. I just, you know, it's tough for me to look at her and be like, oh my, like to just lose myself in that character. I just still see Kristen Stewart. Um, now they did surround her with some top talent here, some top British talent, Timothy Spall, Sally Hawkins, and Sean Harris. That's a hell of a supporting cast for this movie. We still don't know who's going to be playing Prince Charles or, you know, the boys, William and Harry. Um, but I'll tell you what, the most exciting thing about this 
Johnny Greenwood from Radiohead is going to do the score for Spencer. He's, he did, you know, There Will Be Blood and Phantom Thread for PTA. Uh, so that, I think that's a huge get for, for Pablo Lorraine. Uh, before we started taping, Mo Marable, the director of Woke, the Hulu show, just got the, the assignment to do the Three Men and a Baby movie with Zac Efron. Maybe Lamorne Morris will be one of the other three dads. Who knows? Uh, I am eager to see who they pair uh, Zac Efron with. And then Jared Leto, who we talked about earlier, uh, confirmed for that Apple We Crashed series. I think it's Apple. And uh, he's going to be joined by Oscar winner Anne Hathaway. So that's cool. I like the idea of Anne Hathaway and Jared Leto doing a show together and doing a show like that. Uh, Defy Bloods won the National Board of Review. I thought that was kind of interesting because I'd kind of written off that movie's awards chances. I mean, I, I liked the five bloods, but I also thought it went off the rails in the last act uh, when it just became like way more violent than I was expecting. It becomes like a shoot em out, shoot a shootout movie. Um, but, you know, I think that the NBR win kind of cements its status as like a contender this season. And I think I had it on my gurus of gold chart at number 10, Last week, it's either nine or ten again this week. Like it, it, it's uh, it, it's sticking around. It, it, it could manage to slip in there. Um, we will see. Uh, I did like the NBR award went like the acting award winners though. Like those were all great. Like Kerry Mulligan for sure. Both are sound of metal guys. One Riz Ahmed and Paul Racy, and then uh, uh, Yoon Jun or I'm, I know I'm gonna butcher that fucking name, but the grandmother in Minari who was uh, you know. Fantastic. Um, what else? What else? What else? R.I.P. Cloris Leachman and Cicely Tyson, two Hollywood legends, icons. Uh, they are, they both lived incredibly full lives, and they will be missed. Um, Peacock. They announced that uh, they got 33 million signups now. But the big news of this week, and, and what some might even consider the biggest news of the entire week, is that WWE signed some kind of exclusive deal with Peacock. Now I don't watch wrestling. I don't care if this you know is on USA or if it's you know s- streaming on Netflix. Like I just I, I I grew up watching wrestling, and then when I you know came of age, I would say in middle school, it just stopped being cool to me. Uh, obviously, you know, there's still millions of people who, who, who watch this stuff. And then, so I think it's probably a smart play by, by Peacock to now move all those fans, you know, to have them uh, subscribe to the streaming service rather than watch it on USA or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, you know, Peacock's got to get in the game and, and wrestling's a good way to, to get there. I mean, plus there's just so many, you know, wrestlers, whether it's The Rock, Dave Bautista, who who make the jump into, you know, movies, television, whatever it is. So uh, if you can build up this fan base for, for you know, the various wrestlers in this league, you, you know, maybe Peacock ends up signing scripted, you know, the, the, the wrestling stars to scripted shows and movies. Um, HBO Max announced that its activations had doubled. Uh, which sounds impressive, but I still think that HBO is being very slow to convert subscribers to HBO Max, which is like, that's like a marketing thing. Like you, if you have HBO now, you have to know that you can be getting so much more with HBO Max for really the same price. And yet people don't make that jump because they see the two things almost as like separate entities. And uh, they're like, well, I'm happy with HBO. I'm getting all my HBO stuff via HBO. What do I need HBO Max for? Um, yeah, so I feel like Warner Media has some messaging to clear up there. Uh, Bridgerton, Netflix announced it has had 82 million views. But again, this is a shit metric. We can't believe anything that, that Netflix or really any other streaming service says. You're going to count two minutes as a watch. Like the show could autoplay and then just plays for two or three minutes before I even recognize what has happened, recognize that, Oh shit. Like uh, I was, you know, surfing the internet. What's going on. Oh, oh, Bridgerton's on my TV. That's a view now. Get out of here. Like we have to stop making headlines out of these fucking streaming service things, or at least, you know, have them, you know, give everything to, to Nielsen. So there's a third party. I mean, even though I'm sure Nielsen, you know, is carrying water for these places too. Uh, you know, I'd rather have it come from a third party than, than the company itself. The other thing is if you're only putting out wins, 
you know, we had 82 million here, 70 million here. There's no context without the failures, right? So I, I want to know the shows that you're launching that just nobody's fucking watching. And I'm, I'm sorry if that sucks, you know, to the creators and the cast. Oh, nobody's watching my show and now everybody knows it. But like, <coughs> isn't that like the capitalist society that we're a part of? <coughs> you know, like, I just feel, I don't know that we're entitled to, to ratings and stuff like that. But, I, you know, movies can't hide it. I mean, you know, if, you know, as long as they're not on Netflix. But I liked, you know, when, when a movie would come out and you'd know it was either a huge hit or it was a flop. I mean, it, didn't, it doesn't help me sleep easier at night. Like, I, it, it doesn't keep me up uh, wondering, well, what Netflix show flopped? But I, I just think, you know, the, the, the constant cheerleading, it just, it's all empty without some flops. Uh, and speaking of capitalist societies, how about AMC and GameStop stocks? I have no idea what is going on. I am a, a blogger, a writer. My head cannot wrap itself around uh, numbers and, and uh, things like that. I, I can't even tell you how many conversations I've had with my high school friends who are all into the stock market and they're day trading now. I mean, they all make more money than I do, so they have money to play with. But uh I, I, make, I don't understand it at all. Shorting, squeezing, none of it. So if you did it, good luck to you. I, I hope you made money. If you didn't, uh, I don't know what to tell you, man. I, I, I played the stock market once, like a year or two ago. I, I got Fast Pass, you know, or Fast Pass, Movie Pass stock, whatever it was, in the Helios and Matheson stock. And within like a week or two, that money had just disappeared, right? It seemed like everybody I knew was using MoviePass. And then two weeks later, right when I was like, I'm going into the stock market, just totally done, bankrupted. So yeah, I've, I've learned my lesson. I'm not going to fuck around with that shit anymore. Uh, you know, the Dennis Harvey situation has come back full steam. I, I, this is so stupid. It's so silly. Like, you know, I was glad to see that The Guardian interviewed uh, Dennis Harvey, who was the variety critic who had you know, reviewed Promising Young Woman at Sundance a year ago from like today. And then his review was, you know, up there unchanged. Nobody had any problem with it for 11 months until the New York Times asked Carrie Mulligan a leading question about reviews. And Carrie Mulligan, you know, it puts out her interpretation of Dennis Harvey's review, which she is perfectly entitled to her interpretation. But I agree with Dennis Harvey, who's been reviewing movies for 30 years, okay, for variety and knows what to say and what not to say and how to say it. Like, okay, maybe it wasn't his best sentence right? But like Variety just fucking threw this guy under the bus. Uh, like, you know, the newsroom was uncomfortable with the language. Like the newsroom says, when does the fucking newsroom get a vote? When, when, does, when does an editor take responsibility? Like I got fired how many times in my career for decisions I didn't even fucking make, okay? And even if I did make them, someone else signed off on them. These people are just completely insulated editors, w fucking editors, ridiculous. Uh, yeah, if you're the editor who let that go to press, which I assume is Peter DeBruge, the Variety's chief film critic, you're on the hook. It's not Dennis Harvey. Like, if it made it to the website and it made it to the magazine, it is the, the, the chief film critic and the chief film section editor or the editor-in-chief of Variety. Nobody had a problem until Carrie Mulligan said so. Meanwhile, what Dennis Harvey, who went on record and said he's a 60-year-old gay man, so, like, he's not even in his head comparing the relative hotness of one actress to another. I think he's just pointing out that, like, you have to understand, when these people, like Margot Robbie, okay, are producers on a movie, most likely that movie, and I'm not saying this was the case with Promising Young Woman, because I don't know. But most likely that movie was offered to, to Margot Robbie as like a starring vehicle. And maybe it just wasn't right for one reason or the other. Maybe it was a scheduling issue. Maybe she just loved the script, but you know, it's, it's not for me, but I'd love to be a producer on it. But like, believe me, that script gets to her, right? Because they want her. So I, it's like, I, I don't think that Carrie Mulligan was miscast and, and, and the idea that a woman, a woman wouldn't be raped because she's not as attractive as this other woman. I mean, it's absurd. Like anybody can be raped. Uh, men can be raped. Good looking men, ugly men, beautiful women, ugly women. Like, you know, 
I, I just don't think that that's what Dennis Harvey was saying at all. And I, and I hated the response from Variety where the newsroom took a, like a vote on it and, and felt uncomfortable or they just hung this guy out to dry. They threw him under the bus, someone who has toiled for them in the trenches for 30 years because of some woke shit, because some people on Twitter get upset. And now Dennis Harvey deals with death threats and like his whole integrity is called into question. It is fucking crazy. You know, everyone is at fault. And, and you got to take the hit. If you're the publication like Variety or, or the editor who, who worked on that review, but not to mention these reviews, mind you, are being written in a time period of like an hour to three hours after the movie. Like that's what trade reporters do. They rush back to the, to the condo at Sundance and they write things up and it's on the internet two or three hours later. It's not like there's like this huge, big editorial process. Everyone's running on no sleep, no food. Things fall through the cracks. You know, it, just acknowledge that rather than just burying a guy like Dennis Harvey, who mind you, I've never met. I, I'm not here because I'm like a friend, like defending him. I just think it's fucked up that a film critic has to, answer for this thing that he did but didn't really do and you know carrie mulligan i think is the one who owes him an apology because she's really the one who made this more of a, a bigger thing than it is um all i know is i i, I once made the mistake of, of bringing up an actress's looks and by the way i think looks are on the table uh you know that is your 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 paintbrush that is what you you're working with here it's we go to see stars on the big screen and it's not just, is this person a good actor? Sometimes it's, you know, I just want to look at this person for two hours. I mean, that's how 99% of casting decisions are fucking made anyways. So to, 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 to say that looks don't play a part into things is crazy, but I also don't think that looks played a part into things in this. And, and Carrie Mulligan is a very attractive woman. Like I, I think she makes total sense for this role. Um, I don't think that, that she was miscast. Uh, I, I just think that, yeah, p people, they, they take a little sentence, a little phrase, a turn of phrase, and they twist it to fit their own meanings. Um, and I, I don't think Dennis Harvey is like that at all. Uh, we got some trailers this week, a new trailer for Silk Road, which I thought, um, you know, I've seen Silk Road, and I'm not able to talk about Silk Road. Speaking just about the trailer, I think it's a good trailer. I think, you know, uh, like I showed it to Dad, he was excited to watch it. Um, yeah. The poster they released was horrible. It was like this garish yellow poster with 10 different fonts. It was one of the worst posters I think I've ever seen. Uh, but Silk Road, it, it's worth keeping an eye on in, in February, you know, after the, the Sundance hysteria is over and all the Oscar contenders have been released. Keep an eye on that. It could be a nice little VOD play. Excuse me. But I will have more to say about that in the coming weeks. We also got trailers for Crisis, which is an Army Hammer movie. That's about the opioid crisis. It's, it's Army, Gary Oldman, Evangeline Lilly. Uh, you know, again, look like a, a nice two and a half star VOD movie. Uh, there was a trailer that Collider, we, we actually debuted a couple trailers this week for Body Brokers, which is with Frank Grillo and Jack Kilmer. Again, fascinating premise about these rehab facilities that just, you know, have beds to fill. And so they, they literally pay drug addicts to come in and, or, you know, somebody, there's, there's someone in the process who pays drug addicts to go and just sit in the bed. And, and, you know, that way the, the, the hospital or whatever, the rehab facility can bill the insurance and, you know, they can bill them like 60 grand a month. And then they just put these addicts back out on the street. They, 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 the addict blows the money on, you know, getting high for two or three months and then they go right back into rehab. And it's just this vicious circle um so check out that trailer and then check out the trailer for honeydew which marks the feature acting debut of sawyer spielberg who is the son of steven spielberg uh and then reviews this week I, you know uh, there's a couple of things i don't know what i talked about last week my, my brain is absolute mush i loved the tiger documentary on hbo uh, i think tv critics gave it a, a, a bad rap um but it really got me in, in, in part two. Like I, 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 I was crying a couple of times. I just thought it was like a, a beautiful story. Um, you know, it ha had some sad parts obviously, but I mean, the ending hasn't even been written on, on Tiger Square. He's still out there kicking ass. I'd also really recommend Derek Delgadio's in and of itself. Don't read too much about this one. It is a, a stage show that was filmed. He's like a, an illusionist, 
but it's very emotional. Uh, you know, I found myself getting caught up in it and, and was definitely impressed by that one. In fact, everybody who, who everybody I know who's seen that film, which I guess you can call it a film, it's on Hulu, uh, really, really liked it. Uh, I watched a movie called Like this uh, this week, which is also available on VOD. I watched it because Mark Menchaca is in it. And Mark Menchaca really impressed me in Alone, uh, the, the John Hyams thriller from last year. He's playing another you know, kind of creep in this one. It's basically about a girl who, whose sister, um, who, who, who lost her sister and the sister was sort of bullied online. And she, you know, finds the guy who she suspects was behind that bullying and she, you know, kidnaps him and, and tries to torture him for some answers and stuff. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't great, but, you know, I can't even imagine how, how low the budget was on this thing. And, uh, you know, if you like those kinds of thrillers, I, I suppose it's worth checking out. I also saw this movie, I think it's an Argentinian film, 4x4, that hits VOD next week. It's about a carjacker who, who just breaks into the wrong car. And it's basically like an, uh, a steel cage, an, an urban cage, just sitting there in the middle of a city. Uh, and he can't get out. Can't get out of the car. It's soundproof. No one can see, you know, in, in the car because the windows are tinted and he's just locked in this cage. And, and it turns out that the owner is, is fucking with him for kind of like a very specific reason. Uh, I thought that was, you know, pretty, pretty watchable. I, li- I like that idea. I could actually see that be a pretty uh, interesting English language remake. Uh, I saw Brothers by Blood, which is with Joel Kinnaman and Matthias Schoenartz. Love my man Schoenartz. Love them both, really. Uh, this used to be called like The Sound of Philadelphia. It's based on a Pete Dexter novel. And it's like, you know, Joel Kinnaman is like uh, a crime boss. And, you know, um, Sean Arts is his cousin who's a lot more sensitive, doesn't really have the stomach for some of the stuff that Kinnaman does. And so it's like, you know, how does he get out from under the thumb of his crazy cousin? Uh, you know, watchable again a standard VOD thing, but I didn't feel like it was a waste of time or money. Uh, I think later today, I'm going to try to get up a link to Zach Wood's new short film, David, which I have shown to a couple people now and they all loved it. I think it's great. I've seen it three times now. It's a short film starring Will Ferrell as a psychiatrist uh, who, whose session with a patient gets interrupted uh, by, by his son, played by Fred Heckinger from News of the World and soon to be seen in The Woman in the Window. And then finally, uh, the thing that I wanted to review this week um, is The Investigation. And that is the new HBO series about the disappearance of Kim Wall. She was a Swedish journalist who went aboard a homemade submarine for an interview and never came back. Uh, I watched The Investigation, all six episodes in one night. I binged it. It took about four and a half to five hours, I want to say. Uh, but it kept me hooked and I thought it was great. It's very different than any sort of crime procedural I'd seen before. Um, just in sort of its rhythms and the fact that you never, I mean, there's a couple issues with it, but you never see the crime and you never see the suspect. In fact, the suspect isn't even named. He's only referred to as the accused. The problem with the show If there is one, I'd probably give it an A minus. And I may very well write a review for this. But the problem is that you never really get to know Kim Wall. Um, You know, and I think that that would have gone a long way. Although, you know, in an investigation like this, I don't know how much the investigators really do get to know the victim. Or if they just have to sort of depersonalize them and just see them as a body. and, And here are the facts and here's the evidence and here's what we have and don't have. You know, I don't know if her personality makes that much difference to her, to, to, to the investigators, unless, you know, it helps explain her, her behavior, who she was hanging out with and, and, and why. Basically, I, I just think, um, you know, the Hot Reporter review, I think it was, it, it, it was a little too negative. It put a little too much emphasis on the lack of Kim Wall. Uh, I do think that that is a valid criticism of this show. But I thought it was terrific. Like if you love Zodiac or something like that, I I think you'll be super interested in this. Um, Again, it's, it's not, it's not like it's terribly gruesome or anything. It's just, it's, it's, you really feel what it's like to be a cop. There's just so much stuff that the average procedural series would cut out. 
and th- and this show has all that stuff. Uh, particularly, like I love how uh, there are a couple of, of touches where like the police chief before he does anything, he always clears it with the parents of the deceased. Like they are, you know, they always know what's going on. They're at the forefront of the investigation. You don't often see that on these types of shows. And the other thing is, um, uh, what is it? I love it. Right. When, whenever the press calls, whenever this, the, the, the cop gets a call from the press, he's like, you know, I can't comment on that right now, but trust me when I can, you'll be the first to know. And it's just like, Oh my God, is that what they teach these cops to do? And, and how many of these publicists that I deal with, you know, in any given day, how many of them have been trained to do that? How many times have I heard, don't worry, you'll be the first person I tell, you know, and it's just like, they probably say that to, to six different journalists. Um, it was just, you know, it, little touches of humor like that, I think, that, you know, gave, gave the show some levity that it, that it sorely needed. Uh, yeah. And speaking of the, the investigation, you know, it prompted a lot of questions for me about Into the Deep, which was uh, Emma Sullivan's documentary that debuted on Netflix last year. And it's a crazy documentary. It is also about the disappearance of, of Kim Wall, but it's from the other perspective. It's about the submarine builder, the accused. And, you know, Emma Sullivan thought she was just making a movie about this, you know, really smart guy who had this dedicated team and, you know, they're creating submarines and rockets and stuff by hand. Uh, And so she was making a movie about this guy, has footage from the day of the crime. Like she's interviewing this guy an hour before he goes off and does what he does, which is, it's crazy. It's like, you know, what a window into this guy's state of mind. Meanwhile, it, it may not ever see the light of day. So Netflix bought it at the festival last year. Uh, and and then they pulled out because there were people involved in the documentary who were like, well, I never signed a release or you know, it, it's just like, you know, then the cinematographer pulled back his support. And then Netflix was like, you know what? This isn't worth it. I'm, I'm telling you, if you're a distributor out there, it's worth it to somebody. This documentary is going to be, I think it's going to make real waves. I think it's a real conversation starter, a, a big talking point. I hope that somebody does, you know, uh, ante up and, and do it, you know, even if they have to make certain cuts because the movie, the second act of the movie, I thought dragged. It's just that that third act that just packs a wallop, like few m- movies or documentaries I've ever seen. Uh, real quickly, I'll just do a little scan to see if we have any, Mailbag questions, because I could have sworn we got at least one. Stephen Moore writes, Stephen Moore had a lot of questions. That's right. He asked, if, do I have any idea of Daniel Rickman's post about Scorsese's next direct, directing project after Killers of the Flower Moon is going to be Hulu's Devil in the White City miniseries? Uh, I have no idea if, if Martin Scorsese is doing a Hulu series. I find that a little... Hard to believe I could see him, you know, being the executive producer on Devil in the White City. Do I think that he would actually direct? No, but maybe he could direct an episode. That, that's totally possible. Uh, does Hulu really want to wait two years, really, for Killers of the Flower Moon to be all, all done with? You know, like, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Daniel Rickman obviously proven to be right a lot of times, but I also don't think he has a flawless track record on stuff either particularly when it comes to television. Uh, Stephen also asks, have I heard anything about the Leonardo da Vinci biopic that Leo wanted to do? No. Um, yeah, no, I, I really just haven't heard much. Leo's you know, wrapping up the Adam McKay movie, Don't Look Up, and, and then he'll do Killers of the Flower Moon eventually. I, I think that that would go you know, maybe this summer or something. Uh, I don't know what kind of weather that they need for that, um, but it's also a, hu- a huge production, you know, and you know, we may still be hamstrung due to this pandemic. Uh, I think that'll just about do it. I'm just checking the the last news before we wrap up. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know what? Let's end it there. Any, anything that we miss, we can always circle back next week. That's it. Episode 69 in the books. Next week is going to be episode 70. Wow. We are getting up there, folks. Thank you for, for listening, for watching, however you consume this show. Uh, make sure to write, it, write in with any mailbag questions. It doesn't just have to be about movies. It can be about television, what I'm watching, what I'm not watching, and why. About the showdown, about sports, whatever it is. I don't care. I just want to hear from you guys. Let's have a conversation. Thanks for following me on, on Twitter, Instagram, Cameo. Order a Cameo. 
I'll, ma- I'll make it special for you. I'll even do it bare chested if you want or not. And uh, yeah, stay safe out there. Well, you got to keep washing your hands, wear a mask, wear two masks. This thing's getting crazy. There's all kinds of variants. Just stay safe out there. So you, I can see you next week. Have a wonderful weekend. And uh, I'm going to go watch some Sundance movies. Sundance, baby. Next week, we'll talk all about it. Later. Later.